Okay, guys, uh, welcome to the show. I am here today with Kim Iveson. Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a it's an honor. Oh wow! Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I, you know, I've been I've been meaning to talk to you for a while because as I've started to view more and more content on YouTube, particularly since I moved to the U.S. You know, initially when I moved here, we were talking a little bit about this before we came online. That initially when I moved here and I was looking at YouTube content, there seemed to be just these two homogenous camps. All right, there's there's there's, there's the left that thinks a certain way. And then there's the right that thinks a certain way. And then as I watch more and more content, particularly something, uh, the content that you do, you realize that, okay, so what people understand as the left or generally like to call the left isn't as homogeneous as uh, you'd like to think. And, you know, your show is one which, uh, which disagrees with what people would call the sort of progressives and so sort of the left. And we'll get into the definitions of the two things in a little bit, but how would you describe the politics of your show? I would say that I am a progressive and that that term does not apply to everybody on the left, even though it it uh, it is used as sort of a blanket term by some. Some understand that it's actually a faction of the left and others kind of believe it's just all uh, like a generic word for the left. But I would say my show is progressive. I would say that it's very progressive. Right. That was, see, that was complete news to me because I genuinely thought the two things were one and the same. So how would you say a progressive differs from someone that would be considered part of the left? Well, we have a, a specific agenda, which is to rid the government of, pol of money. So rid mm -hmm. politics of money. Um, and also we're very focused on the social, on the socioeconomic systems that are keeping people down. So we believe more in class warfare. Um, and I think what a, a big, huge other section of the left, I would say that the, the establishment, um, they're really focused on social justice. So they're very focused on racial issues. Mm -hmm. And I would say that progressives are more focused on class issues. So right. I would say that's the big difference. And economic as well, right? Like class-based sort of more economic issues right. that necessarily have to do with, okay, cultural issues. Right, right. We would say that the reasons why people are held back is because of class issues, that systems are rigged against people to keep them poor, um, that it is, you know, of course, race does have something to do with that. There is some, as they say, intersectionality. I don't really like to use those fancy words that a lot of them use, but um, there is, you know, of course, there's some, there's some, uh, there's stuff at play there, right? There's even being a woman, being black, there've been historically laws and um, ways that people have been prohibited from doing certain things, right? That's been baked into the system at times. So of course you can't ignore that stuff, but at the end of the day, it's more about, and what I believe even those issues stemmed from was about money. That the reason why there was oppression wasn't necessarily because people really thought others were lower than them or less wor you know, worth less or less human, that it really just had to do with trying to keep a leg up on people, mm. trying to economically game the system. Right, right. And it, it's very interesting, you know, to see something like that, because I feel like there's part of the blame, you know, sort of has to lie with the right in the terms in way that it likes to label people uh, or it has labeled people in the past and continues to do so. Because every time you watch something that someone on the right tends to say, they always say, oh, we're fighting these progressives. And these progressives are saying that, oh, they only talk about these social issues. They only talk about these racial issues. Progressives are. And that's when they're talking about what they're actually talking about are the left, in your opinion. And right, right. You're, all, you're someone that, you know, there's another narrative that's been built that anybody who sort of falls anywhere left of center believes whatever CNN and MSNBC say as pretty much gospel truth. And you're also someone that doesn't necessarily always agree with the CNN and the NBCs of or the MSNBCs of the world. So right. what, do you feel that progressive voices are represented in a major way 
in the mainstream conversation or not at all? No, yeah, not really. Um, once in a while, they'll invite a progressive on maybe the shows just to, <laughs> uh, but to fill up the numbers, eh? Yeah, or 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 just to kind of get the other perspective, but then they try to uh, smear a progressive or no, there there's really no progressive narrative going on in mainstream media. So whether it be CNN, MSNBC, or even in ma the major news uh, written news outlets like Washington Post, New York Times. Um, none of them really have a progressive narrative going on at all. So I would say that progressives, you know, that's another thing is that we're, we're, we believe we're actually the bigger group. Um, really? So yeah, we actually think that, yeah, for sure. That when you talk to the average person who says that they're on the left side of the political spectrum, that the majority of them actually would agree more with the progressive agenda than they would the mainstream media narrative that's being pushed. We believe that that push for that narrative um, largely is still being controlled by the money and the system, that they're wanting to keep the system in place, that the people who are wanting to keep the monetary system the way it is are on both sides of the political spectrum, the left and the right, and they're using the media as a means to keep people distracted away from the real issues and focused on the issues that do not harm their bottom line. But that's interesting. Do you see any candidates, because especially on the Democratic side, now I think we're up to 763, the number of candidates that are running for president. Right? Yeah, right. They collectively and, all together got together and said, you know what? We're all Democrats. Let's all run for president. That's yeah, what it let's feels all like. run every we're single all one gonna of run. us. Yeah. yeah, we're yeah, all running. Walk down the street, they're like, do you like Democrats? Yeah, all right, you can run. You know, it's almost yeah, like yeah. that now. So of all the candidates that are running for, for to get, you know, the nomination, do you see a candidate that you can point out and say that, okay, that's a guy that is a true progressive? Yeah, I would say that true progressives in the race right now would be Bernie Sanders is the big one. Uh, Bernie Sanders really was the one who brought the progressive movement to the forefront and into the mainstream where, you know, when he ran in 2016, he started off a really small campaign. No one really knew who he was. And the more he was talking, it resonated with people and people said, yeah, actually, this makes sense. This is what I want. Right. And so I think Bernie Sanders has been the main um, you know, he's like the father of the modern progressive movement, I would say. I, I would say Tulsi Gabbard is another big progressive that's in the race. Um, I would say those are the two really big progressives. Right. There are some that are that uh, that could also be classified. I don't know if they're as progressive. I would I would say like Elizabeth Warren is a progressive, but I wouldn't say she's as progressive. Right. Um, I would say that uh, maybe, you know, I'd have to look more into, and I just don't know enough about sure. Pete Buttigieg and Andrew Yang sure. to call them progressives. I wouldn't really call Andrew Yang a progressive. He's innovative. He's got really interesting ideas. They're different. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's really fighting, though, the money in politics. I think he kind of like glosses over that and doesn't realize that, look, you're not going to get anything done. Nothing. Yeah. You're getting nothing done until we can get the money out of politics. Yeah, that's a good point. And so looking at Bernie, for example, he, he you consider he's someone you consider a true progressive, but he's quite socially liberal as well. You know, so you, you could also make the case that he's part of the left in a way that where he's quite conscious of social issues and he's quite vocal often on social issues and how liberal he is about those issues as well. So how would you differentiate someone like Bernie or, or because you say there's a differentiation between a progressive and somebody that falls on the left. So Bernie sort of exhibits both of those facets, doesn't he? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, okay. I think that he definitely, uh, as of late, I would say specifically because he's trying, he's running again for president. And I think he realizes that in order to get certain voters in, you can't, mm. alien, you know, you've got to kind of bring you've got to kind of bring in the social justice uh, people into the conversation as well. So I feel like when I'm, as I'm watching him run this time around, he is trying to be more inclusive of others in that way. Um, but I, but even when you listen to him, when you still right. listen to him talk, he'll still divert always to class issues. So like reparations, for example, is a conversation that a lot of people are having. So there's a lot of, you know, the African descendants of slaves, 
who would like to see some form of reparation. And Bernie Sanders has said over and over, no, I don't think that we should have reparations. Right. Um, I just think that we need to build a system that's equitable. So he's kind of saying it's the system, it's classism. And if you can fix that classism, if you can, if you can make the system equitable, then the people who are the most harmed would be the ones who benefit the most from the programs, right? Because if they're disproportionately poor, they're going to be disproportionately helped if the programs are, are made to help the poor. Right. Um, so you'll always kind of hear him, uh, even though, yes, he does say Trump is a racist. You know, he's been saying that a lot. And we do need to have more equality in the races. He still his solutions are still uh, economic based. I see. Yeah. And it's very interesting uh, looking at somebody like Bernie and what somebody like Bernie is trying to achieve, because I, I almost feel like at this point in American politics and, you know, that's not unique to American politics. I think it happens all over the globe. But money, big business and sort of politics is so inextricably linked at this point where it almost feels like an impossible job, that how are you going to be able to get money who's got its claws sunk so deeply into the American political system? How do you even go about starting that process? You have to change the media narrative. I mean, mm. it ultimately comes down to getting the people understanding what's going on, educating the people, eyes wide open, right? If mm. the American people have their eyes wide open, then they're able to scream about it a lot and, and really put a lot of pressure on the plutocrats, the oligarchy that are running our government. Um, it is it is a huge task. They're not going to go down, you know, they're not going to go down without a fight. Oh, I don't that's imagine that. That's for sure. So, you know, we know that this is going to happen. Of course, like we're seeing it even now in the presidential race, for example, the healthcare battle. Right. Um, you even see people that are seemingly progressives like Elizabeth Warren, as I mentioned, and she's now teetering on Medicare for all. She kind of says, well, you know, maybe there's a few other ways to go about this. And you know that what's happened there is that the money's gotten to her, right? The people with the big pockets have said, look, if you want eventually our money, um, in order to, to, cause she said that she would take big money if she won the nomination going into the general election that she would. So I'm sure they're sitting there saying to her, listen, if you want our backing, then you're going to have to work with us on this. And it can't just be an all out, get rid of the private healthcare insurance companies that we're going to have to do some kind of like a dance in order to get there. And so she's saying, okay, but there's a big problem with that. You know, there, that's their way of say, of talking a politician into, not going with what we know needs to happen. We just have to rip the Band-Aid off. They're, and, and what they can do is they can make the system suck so bad during this weird transition that right. people say, you know what, just go back to the old way. That's what they're hoping, right? They're hoping that they can do this like soft move into healthcare and um, through like plans that Elizabeth Warren is now touting and ultimately uh, sway public opinion. You know, like I said, they're just not going to go down without a fight. They're going to do whatever they can to stay to stay afloat. And they are infiltrating. And it's difficult because they're able to talk to these politicians and get them to somewhat agree with them. Right, right. It, it, one of the most interesting reactions that I've seen of mainstream media, whether the mainstream media is, it's, whether it's part of the left, whether it's part of the right, one of the most interesting reactions that I've seen is to someone like Tulsi Gabbard. And I do genuinely believe that a large part of that reaction comes from her stance on America's interventionist policy across yeah. the globe, right? Right, right. Because you have politicians on both sides of the aisle that are in bed with the military industrial complex. Yeah. And that get funding from it, that get support from it. And it's, it's you know, it's a major, major industry. Major industry. Take, for example, the war in Afghanistan, which is, supposed to, I don't know, probably last a year or so tops, but we're what, 18 years going and probably longer at this yeah. at this stage. Right. We've got the war, you know, we've got the problems happening in Iraq that don't seem to be going away anytime soon. So, and you know, there's, there's people who are saying the, the United States should probably go to war with Iran at some point. So. Yeah. And Venezuela, you know, now we're yeah. talking about potentially invading Venezuela and we definitely have our eyes on Iran. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, and so it's very interesting because when somebody says that we should not indulge in interventionist wars and we should not uh, topple a government for the sake of it, it, it almost looks like, so they're painting it out to say that, okay, this is a lady that is a supporter of Assad, A, and B, this is a lady that is anti-war. Both of which, in my opinion, are not true. This is not a person who supports Assad, who just says that, well, overthrowing Assad is going to lead to the situation that we've had for the past five years, but, you know, multiply that by 10. And, yeah. Right? And in terms of, she's not saying that she's opposed to war. She's saying that she's opposed to interventionist wars, interventionist right? Wars, right, right. right. So of course, yeah, if somebody's yeah. going to threaten the U.S.'s safety, if somebody's threatening our security, we go to war. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, and if it's uh, like World War II, we would go to war again if that situation were to be here today. Of course, we would go to war. Um, yeah, it's not an anti-war. It, it is specifically an anti-intervention only when right. the type of war that is being waged is for purposes that are not beneficial really to the American people. Uh, it, it's all about the money for, for special interest groups. And, um, you know, so yeah, when you take on the war machine, the American War Department, uh, you know, they renamed it the Department of Defense. It really should just right. go back to being the War Department. Uh, <laughs> when you- It would be more take, accurate, wouldn't it? It would be, yeah. Um, you know, if we think Medicare for all is a battle, that is nothing compared to the War Department. And the thing is about the medical the medical industry is yes, there's a lot of big people who have a lot to gain from it. Um, and they're still greasing the politicians' pockets. They're they're funding their campaigns and they've got leadership packs and they're taking them, you know, a bunch of fancy things and whatever. Um, that is not gonna go down without a fight. But the War Department is way bigger, has way more money and is influencing way more than just Americans. You know, the medical industry is just, it's contained to the United States. It's right. just Americans. The War Department, on the other hand, you're talking about money and influence that not only is Americans who have something to gain, but you've got international players who have something to gain from it. So the, the pressure comes from not just within, but also outside. You know, you've got like the Saudi family, right? right? And you've got a variety of other players that are involved. You've got imperialists in Europe. I mean, you know, as much as I've uh, looked over across the pond, right? And seen like Germany and Angela Merkel and how she seems to be the new leader of the free world and whatnot. Right. We still have to remember who we're talking about. Germany and England, though they might seem to be more progressed, uh, progressive in some ways, like with their healthcare and whatnot at the end of the day, invented imperialism. You know? Yeah, it's true. It's, it's, <laughs> Modern I, imperialism. I find it so incredible that the world does not force the United Kingdom to go sort out some of the messes that it's created across yeah, the globe. And right. they're just like, and Europe just turns around, looks at the US and said, hey, go take care of this problem right. that we created 100 years ago. We don't want to send any soldiers there. We don't but want you to guys spend will. any money on yeah. it. Yeah, but why don't the United States station thousands of troops there, spend a gajillion dollars on, on these problems, and at the end of the day, never solve them at the end of the day, too. So right. I, and, I and then like to say, and important. what they and they turn around, they say, and by the way, you have our backing. Like right. go and do all these things so that it's you doing it, but you've got our support 100 percent Yeah, so you're out there in the Middle East getting walloped, and all you get from the from Europe is a pat on the back. Yeah, well, encouragement. It's incredible that nobody yeah. really notices that and nobody really says to the UK, hey, how about you spend some money? How about you spend, you know, send a few soldiers down here and take care of this problem that you created in the first place? Yeah, they say, look, we we our imperialist days are over. We already did that. Now that's you guys incredible. need to take the baton and go. And that's what Americans are doing. I mean, it's it's you know, the the British, even the Germans attempted it, right, when they tried to take over Europe. Uh, the French certainly have been doing it for forever as well, and the right. Spanish. Um, and yeah, you know, they America was obviously a product of that to begin with. And so, yeah, they basically said, look, our imperialist days are over, but you guys, we invented you, we created you, and we supported you. And the French are like, and, you know, we made sure you became your own free nation. Right. So, um, 
you guys need to do our dirty work. And that means that you guys need to go and start all these wars all around the world and make sure that you get the resources and then share them with us. And we'll be right. allies in this. So it is difficult to have the conversation, even with Americans, because, you know, in order to get them to understand that there's such a big problem here, they kind of point to our allies in Europe and they say, yeah, but they say that this is necessary as well. They say that this is the right thing to do. And it's like, who are you talking about here? You're yeah. talking about they don't England, have to spend any money France. on their own. Yeah. Right, right. Well, they're not going to anymore. They say that their work, they've already done that, been there, done that. That's just, yeah, I, that's just incredible that that doesn't get brought up enough. There's another in, very uh, interesting critique that I've seen of somebody like Tulsi Gabbard is, uh, and, I, and I saw her on Colbert, and I think he brought it up too. He said that, oh, well, uh, you know, you're a good candidate and all, but uh, what do you have to say about somebody like David Duke or some of these far-right nationalists supporting you? And I mean, unbelievable. I found that to be such a incredible just straw man argument because it, it's just like okay well if you say that people should eat healthy and a white nationalist comes to say oh well i agree with that yeah people should eat healthy that does not make the argument of eating healthy a bad argument right nor right. does it make you a bad person for saying that <laughs> right it's, right. Just, it's incredible that it, it's such a lazy argument at the end of the day which makes it such a disappointing argument well, and it's meant to smear, right? It's meant to cast a shadow on the person and make them look like there's something sinister going on there and there just isn't. Um, you know, why do white nationalists like Tulsi Gabbard? Why do they like people like Andrew Yang? I don't know. They're both people of color. It's weird, right? That that white nationalists who are looking to purify, you know, the, or they want what they, I think what their agenda is, many of them, they say that they just want to keep people ethnocentrically mm -hmm. in their regions, right? Um, you know, like, I, I don't know why they would like them. And it is, it is something that's, it is a very lazy, it's disingenuous, and it's meant to smear. And they don't ask that of the other candidates. You know, they don't ask them why so and so likes them, who might be a person who's counter to what they stand for. Um, if anything, I'd say, well, good. If they're starting, if these white nationalists are starting to like these candidates, maybe the white nationalists are starting to change. Isn't that what we're looking for? Aren't we looking to change their minds? Aren't we looking right. to make change in America and to get people to move forward and, and progress as, as human beings? You know? Yeah. And, and whether or not a white nationalist supports a good idea does not take away the validity right. of the good idea. Right. The good idea will be a good idea no matter who supports it or exactly. Like it, you know, exactly. But yeah, she's fighting an uphill battle because not only, you know, Bernie's already got it hard with mm -hmm. with his battle with, you know, Medicare for all and universal education and other programs like that that take from the rich. But boy, when you take on the international community, uh, you're you're gonna get it from everywhere. And they certainly have been doing a major smear job on her. And, and it's tough. And they've done that in the past with almost every single anti-war candidate. Um, you go back to the 60s and anybody who was anti-war, they buried and they still bury these people. And it's right. really important now. And I think what's great is, you know, we do have um, platforms like YouTube where people can start talking about this and start swaying people and start getting people to understand that we got a real big problem on our hands. And it, you know, if people think that our racial relations inside of our country are bad, look at what we're doing to other nations. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, I mean, look at Libya. There's an open slave market. Yeah. I mean, these people are not better off. Um, you know, look at uh, what's going on in the Middle East and we've helped create these extremists who come in and rule, rule groups of people with really extreme laws. Yeah. We help usher them in. Yeah, it is crazy. Uh, it, it, it's 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 short sighted to say the least. And you know, to 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 just be to just offer a conservative criticism, I would say that it's completely short sighted because this is something that the United States has done more than once. But I feel like it, over it's and over and where, over, yeah, <laughs> where it continues to make the same mistake. You know, the, the definition of insanity is basically doing the same thing over and over again, right. expecting a different result. Right. But that different result isn't going to come by, by this methodology. So, yeah, I mean, that's an important one. Another thing I really wanted to talk to you about is, is 
you know, but particularly in sort of rural, uh, rural America or small town America, one of the things that you see people say is that, oh, we're, we're not in favor of taxation as it is. And we're very, very against high levels of taxation. America rebelled against the taxation that the British were giving us and so on and so forth. And people are not in, you know, people are not in favor of paying a lot of tax in America. That's the, at least that's a conservative narrative. And so, you know, whenever a conservative president comes to power, they reduce the tax rates and so on. But for a lot of progressive policies to be actually, to become reality, you're going to have to need to raise taxes yeah. uh, in certain cases to quite a significant extent. Do, do you think that this is something that would be realistic in a nation like America that has this historical problem with taxes, A, and do you think that that narrative with the popularity somebody like Bernie enjoyed during at least the 2016 run, do you think that narrative is changing? I think that if you can show people, um, for for one, uh, the, the conservatives are going to do everything they can to smear the tax, you know, smear taxes, right? Mm. Because they definitely don't want it. So there is, of course, going to be that battle and that discussion. But I think what needs to really be uh, explained to people is high taxes, yes, but as long as there there are also high wages and high standard of living then it's all okay. And that is the, that's the Scandinavian model. They have extremely high cost of living. I was just recently in Denmark. I spent some time there. My family is originally from there. And we went back to the motherland, you know, to, to, to kind of check it yeah. out. And it was outrageously expensive. I couldn't believe how expensive Denmark was. And the people there were like, oh, this is nothing compared to Oslo, Norway. I mean, Norway wow. is even, even crazier. I mean, we're talking like a smoothie cost me 18 bucks. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was... It was absurd the amount of money stuff was in in Denmark, but when I was asking our taxi driver who was who had immigrated there from Poland, um, I'm like, gosh, I mean, is it just really expensive to you? And he said, oh no, he says because we have high wages and yeah, we have high taxes, but as long as we also have high wages and our standard of living is really high, so everything's quite good. Um, right. You know, if we can just get people to understand that. You're raising up the quality of living. You're not going to see homeless people on the street. You're not going to have healthcare crises. You're not, you know, you're going to have solid educations. You're going to have high wages. And yes, you're going to have high taxes, but it's all going to be worth it in the end. Uh, you know, if we can just explain this and keep kind of screaming it, I guess, then slowly people's minds are changing. Ultimately, as people continue to live like this and they see that the system isn't working the way that it is, they do mm. start to say something needs to give, something right. needs to change. How do you think that communication process is going at the moment? <laughs> Not very well, right. right? I mean, I think that the there's just been a massive breakdown in communication in general in the in the US with politics. Um, everybody is just pointing the finger at each other and screaming at each other. And, you know, it's even happening inside the parties, right? The parties are imploding. Really, we've got four parties mm. going on. Um, you Well, maybe, I mean, and there might be some little other fringe parties, but there's definitely four predominant parties that really need to split from one another. You've got the progressive left, which is what I'm a part of. Then you've got the, I would say, the mainstream try to keep coming up with a name for them. It's because they're. I don't feel like they are the mainstream because I actually think mainstream are progressives. I think we right. have the majority. So I would say that they're the, they're like the outrage. They're like the loud fringe. Right? The lo right. They're very loud. Um, and they prop up the establishment. You know, they just think that Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi, that all these people are really, really great, that everything a liberal does or everything a Democrat does is a win, that Democrats just need to win at all costs. Um, so you've got, I would say, like the social justice left or something. And then you've got the progressive left. Um, and on the right, you've got the Trumpers. Right. You've got these Trumpers and then you've got the never Trumpers. Right. So you've got these Republicans who hate him and these Republicans who have he, they're like following him hook, line and sinker. And so they're also having some serious infighting, even in their own party, just like we are. I mean, we're all just fracturing apart. And actually, I think that the progressive left has more in common with the libertarian right than they do right. even with the with the, the um, neoliberal left or whatever. 
And I think that the neoconservatives and the neoliberals have more in common than the neoconservatives do with libertarians and progressives. Libertarians and progressives both say the system sucks. Something has to change, right? right? Like it sucks. We want out. Now, libertarians just have a different methodology. They think the way to end it is to just erase it, get rid of it, get rid of all the regulation, get rid of government control, get rid of it. And progressives have a different uh, different idea, which is, no, we need, we need to build a different economic system. This isn't working. This pure capitalism um, isn't working. So, but this this system that you're talking about, that progressives talk about, doesn't this involve a greater level of sort of government control? Um, I would say not necessarily. No, okay. I don't think they. I mean, I think that when you implement government programs, there would be, um, you know, like with the medical system, for example. The clinics, the hospitals, and the doctors could still independently run. They don't, mm. they're not going to become government workers. They would work for themselves or for whatever entity they're working for. They would just all accept government um, insurance. Right. And, but that would lead to, I feel like, a certain degree of raising taxes, a lot of government programs that people are going to be dependent on. And I feel like what the libertarians tend to say is that, oh, well, we don't need anything. And there, there was a very interesting, uh, there was a very interesting video that I saw. There was a podcast on Joe Rogan where Dave Rubin was, and Dave Rubin. Oh yeah, Dave Rubin's a big a, libertarian. Yeah, yeah, that's someone who talks to a lot of libertarians as well. Right. Uh, and he was saying that you know we don't need any of these checks and balances in place from the government because the free market's going to take care of everything. And I don't also, I don't necessarily know if I believe that because I feel like people have a tendency. A lot of people, let's not say everyone, but I feel like a lot of people have the tendency to weasel out of doing the best job that they can if they can do right. the same job for a lower effort or a lower price or something like <laughs> right. that. So, right? Right. So, right. I feel like there would be that clash, don't you think, when it comes to like the progressive left and the libertarians as to how do we reconcile that? The thing, though, that I feel like with the progressive left and libertarians is that they're both at least willing to have the conversation. That's a big one. Right. And I think that the, the those in the, the neoliberals and the neoconservatives, they're just unwilling, really. They just want to scream racism or they want to scream, uh, you know, you know, like part of the Republican left that's real big into Trump. Right. They're just blindly screaming like liberals are terrible and look what they're doing. They're destroying America and they don't mm. really want to have a conversation with liberals. They just want to scream about liberals. Yeah. And that's kind of what's going on on the left as well, is that they don't want to have a conversation with right wingers. They just want to own them. Right. Like both of those <laughs> sides are like, we're just going to own you. <laughs> we're going to show you. And it, really, at least progressives and libertarians are like, OK, can we at least talk this out and come yeah. up with a plan and study this and find out what the real root of this issue is so that we can solve a problem? Um so, you know, Liber Dave Rubin's an interesting one, right? Because that's a guy that went from progressive and yeah. the progressive movement to libertarian, which is why I say I do think that progressives and libertarians have more in common right. than you would than you would suspect. Right. Um, you know, like a lot of the people that Dave Rubin talks to on his show, I largely agree with a lot of what these people say, you know, when yeah, it you know, they, I feel like make a lot of sense when it comes to a lot of things, especially the free speech stuff. I'm also in that camp. I'm a big free speech person. Um, I do think that the silencing, the censoring and all that stuff is a giant problem. And I absolutely side with them when it comes to that. Um, but, you know, having that, but that's, and again, that's a function of people wanting to have conversation, wanting to talk. So yeah, I do that's think- That's a crazy one, isn't it? Because I, because I just feel like People are complex, you know, people are, I feel like the, the way the internet works today is that it just pay, tries to paint people as either A or B, you know, and I feel like 90% of humanity is very complex, you know, they're, they're not, you know, they, they agree with this part that you might say is a conservative viewpoint, they might agree with this part that you might say is a very, very liberal viewpoint. And I know so many people that fall along that spectrum and not, you know, either left or right. I'd say Myself the majority, right? Yeah, the majority. Yeah, the majority. And I think the point that you make about trying to have conversations or the willingness to have conversations. And I saw a video of yours where you were talking about the same, that 
it is so important for people to just be able to at least talk to each other and have willing be willing to have those conversations. And I think that is literally one of the most important points that one can make because like we just said, people are complex. People don't agree 100% with A or 100% with B. And so talking and finding those, those common grounds uh, is a major way forward in being able to solve many, many pressing issues. I, I genuinely feel that. And I just feel like it's social media set up right now in a way that it almost discourages people from having conversations. You Twitter feel especially. Yeah. Twitter especially. I hate Twitter. I even have that on my profile. I hate Twitter. I'm on it every day, but I hate that platform. And I hate it because of that, because it, it limits you to these characters, right? You can only have so many. And it, and so you have these battles with people back and forth where people just send out quick tweets and all of this really necessary, complex context is missing. Yeah. And it's just a quick, oh, it's racist. Oh, bigots you know, extremists, libtards, like whatever they want to say, right? Like they just, um, it's just a place to shout at, shout at each other, shout names and create this dialogue. And that's how extremists are formed, right? And that's kind of the video you're talking about that you're referencing is when I was um, talking about, about the extremists and the shootings and the terrorist attacks and um, how do we combat that and the thing is, is that when people have it in their brain that the other side is just evil, right? So if you're a liberal, you think, okay, the other side, they're just racist bigots. And so they want to do harm to people. You know, we've seen liberal terrorists um, in the news at points, and they want to do harm to the people that they think are destroying the country that are right. that are harming others you know they see themselves as like a freedom fighter in a way that's like okay i'm gonna liberate the united states from these people who are oppressive and racist and bigoted and then you've got these other people on the right side on the uh on the right who are turning into extremists because they say oh my god like we're being invaded we're being infiltrated like right. they're not caring about our issues we're being demonized we're being you know and because of that infighting, then you take somebody who's already going to be a little bit uh, prone to this, right? Not most of us are not, most no. of us are not, but you just get that individual who is prone to this sort of brainwashing, prone to becoming an extremist, and they're easily radicalized because they're not hearing any conversation. Yeah. They're not hearing both sides. They're hearing one side. Yeah. And I also think that, you know, you made, you made another good point, which I really agreed with, was you said that, oh, many people, either on the left or on the right, I think it, it's more of a problem on the left than the other way around, at, at least in this moment, because a lot of people on the left say that, okay, I'm not going to talk to this person because I'm not going to give them a platform right? because that means legitimizing them. And right. I do think, in fairness, I do think that there is a case to be made for certain individuals that okay, we don't need this guy to be saying the kind of stuff that he says on every single platform. But again, that's only 5% of the people, 10% of the people, if we're being really, really liberal. But I think it's way less people, than that. Right? Yeah. yeah. But 90% of the people who you're saying, oh, we're not going to talk to these people because that means legitimizing them. 90% of the people don't fall into this category. They have an opinion that you don't agree with. And so you say, okay, I'll tell you what, let me try talking to this guy or this lady, and maybe I can change their mind. Maybe they can change my mind, or maybe we can agree on a little something or disagree on a little something and move it forward, even if it's just an inch, but we can move it forward. And I think yeah. that's an important one. And uh, this whole argument of I'm not going to talk to them because that means legitimizing them. I don't necessarily buy it in all cases. I, I think it's really only uh, the people that I would say I would not want to talk to and legitimize. And when I say talk to in a public way, sure. I'd want to talk to them privately, but not sure. publicly. Um, that would be the, the actual extremists who have murdered people, people who have actually done harm. I don't want to talk. I don't want to give them a platform, right? right? I mean, if you are the guy that shot up the people at Christ Church in New Zealand, sure. I don't want to talk to you. I don't even want to say your name. I haven't even said that guy's name and I sure, won't say sure. that guy's name because I don't want to legitimize that guy. I don't want to make anybody, I don't want to turn him into some kind of a celebrity. So 
that to me is where the line is. It's a person who is, they, they are, they've committed crime in a way that is heinous. Um, but, uh, you know, I, and I'm a little bit hesitant on saying even people like David Duke or Richard Spencer, right. or those guys, I, part of me says, well, but those guys have such a big following already that you kind of have to find out why, right? Like there's got to be some conversation there, I think, to find out what are they, where, you know, so that one is also kind of borderline to, but to even right. those guys, the, the current guys, I don't think they're actually saying now I could be wrong total. Cause I never listen to those guys. So I have right. no idea. Um, but I don't think that they call for violence. Mm. I don't think they actually say, this is what we want to do. Like we want to violently, um, you know, ethno purize our nation. Well, I if think they what said they say that, is that they want to create a, a ethno state where, you know, whites can live in this conclave wherever it is and then the others live wherever they live and when asked i believe some of them that how are you going to if, if something like that actually becomes law will you enforce it and they say yes we will so i do think that that would probably involve some sort of forcible movement of people from one well place deportation one place, but, yeah, right like but, deportation but that would be the extent of it i think yeah yeah. So I, so even with those guys, I think that there's, I, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm a big free speech person. So mm -hmm. even with those guys, I would say, yeah, maybe, maybe I would have a conversation with them publicly. I can't, I wouldn't rule that out just yet. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe people will get mad at me for saying that saying, Oh, how dare you that you wouldn't absolutely say no to those guys. But, um, yeah, I'm just, I, I'm not willing to say no to conversation and to learning and to finding, finding out, especially people who are growing a base. If they're right. growing a base, I want to know why. And I think that yeah. that needs to be exposed. And at the same time, you know, the, the importance of talk, being able to talk about things freely is that you're, you're giving, you're having these ideas, you're having all these ideas that these people are espousing come into the free market of ideas. And then in the free market of ideas, if these ideas are terrible ideas, then they will sink. If these ideas right. are good ideas, then they will swim. Right. And right. so you're also bringing these ideas, which are obviously abhorrent ideas, you're bringing these ideas out in the front and you're letting people see these ideas and be like, all right, well, these people are clearly not nice people, so I'm not going to support these people. And then those ideas die a natural death. And that's sort of what you're saying as well, right? Yeah, I just think that we need to have conversations. If people are not, I mean, especially if they're growing a base, right? I mean, if they right. are growing a base, we've got to know why. Otherwise, it will grow right underneath us. Oh, yeah. And then the resentment will build. And once that resentment builds, then you do end up with these extremists, right? Because then they feel like they're not being heard. They feel like uh, whatever it is that they're feeling angst about, people are ignoring. And then they do radical things in order to be heard. Those yeah. are messages that they're sending. They're doing these radical things as a message. So I would say, you know what? It's better that we hear them out before they get to a point of radicalization where they're like, okay, now I need to go to the extreme and start mailing people bombs or whatever it is that they feel like they need to do. Um I, I just don't think it's healthy to ignore people and to say, I'm not going to even hear that out. I'm going to pretend like it doesn't exist and hope it goes away. I don't know how that's ever solved any problem in life. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I completely agree with you when you say the whole thing about, you know, if you, if you completely just ignore them and you say, oh, well, this, this isn't really a serious thing. We don't need to worry about something like this. Then it can really grow under your nose. And uh, I feel like there are similarities to be drawn with the 2016 elections now before anybody comes at me i'm not saying that trump and a white supremacist are the same thing i'm not saying that at all uh, a, lot, a lot of people say that trump's a racist i just think he's out of touch and a troll i don't i don't think necessarily he's a, he's <laughs> i think a racist, he's a bit so. of a i think he's a bit of an ethno-nationalist actually you think yeah I, I think he would i think he would prefer to live in a white society with white people and yeah, but I do think he would like Mexican laborers. So I, I well, don't know right. That's, well, I was just right. going to say that I do think that he wants you know blacks and Mex Mexicans and women and whatever to kind of work for him right. in the ways that he deems fit. But I think he, I think ultimately he does. I do think he's a bit of a. I don't know, you know, like 
it's there. It's kind of like the old racist grandpa, you know, like we all yeah, have one of those. Thinking. He's just that old, you know, crotchety guy. Uh, old ideas. Yeah. yeah, he hasn't evolved. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. So, you know, but but then again, I, I think there are similarities where people completely, well, they didn't ignore him. I mean, every news channel was playing Trump all the time. But what they ignored was that, okay, well, yeah, we're going to show this joker on our TVs because he says this crazy stuff every now and then, you know, every day. So we're going to keep showing this guy on our TVs, but he's not going to win because he doesn't have any support. Nobody's going to vote for this guy. So, you know, they continue to ignore it. And then, well, everybody knows what happened in November. But, right, uh, right. But that's, well, that's, a, that's a thing, right, where people just ignored it and look what happened. Well, it's the same thing that's going on with the progressive movement. It's that the mainstream uh, media is just yeah. trying to ignore it and just kind of act like it's not happening underneath them, that the people aren't feeling this angst, uh, that the people, you know, and, and what we're seeing is what's looking, what's going on in France is an exact indication of this as well. Uh, the riots that are happening, the protests, the yellow vests in France, it's the same thing. There was this growing angst amongst the people of feeling like the rich were getting wealthier and the poor were staying poorer and it was this they were starting to see that class the class issues and uh we're seeing this here in america and look at what's happened in france i mean it's like look they rejected the trump person they rejected right. marine le pen they mm -hmm. said we're not going to buy into this you know this nationalist narrative uh, this ethno-nationalist stuff. We're not going to go for this. They said, I guess we'll pick this other guy. This is a better deal, uh, we guess. And, <laughs> you know, they get him in and he's just like the neoliberals here in America, all about the rich people. And that mm -hmm. build, that, that, that angst that had been building in France that helped the rise of people like Marine Le Pen. She came from that feeling. She was one of them a representative of that. Now she's placing blame in the wrong place, just like Trump is. Trump mm. is placing blame on the others, right? The people who are coming into the country and it's their problem. And it's really a problem in the actual government itself. Yeah. Um, and so the French, you know, what are you, what are you seeing over there is that there's this, this, this movement growing, this feeling growing amongst the people. And even when it looked like they turned their backs on the ethno nationalist person, um, they're riding in the streets and burning everything up now. Right. I mean, they have finally had it. And they right. said, yeah, we thought we were better off with this guy, but it turns out it's all now, it's more of the same, more of the same. And now we just need to burn down the whole place, literally. Um, that's a really and good point. I, I that's why we can't really ignore point. this. Yeah, I really do think so. And, you know, we've seen in sort of the time between 2013 to 2016, 17, we've seen the left go a little bit too far on certain issues. And we've seen a certain amount of irritation from that, even among people who would consider themselves liberals, even among people who would right. consider themselves progressives and people even on the left, you've seen a certain amount of irritation that, okay, maybe we're taking things a little bit too far. Maybe just maybe not literally everything a person says has to be problematic you know maybe right. not everything maybe not everything a person say has to piss us off and you know send out 20,000 tweets in a day so i think it's natural though for you know when when people feel oppressed and when people feel like they've been bullied for a really long time right. i do think it's pretty natural to overcorrect right. so i think what is happening is the left is overcorrecting for years of feeling um you know this this feeling of like whites you know the white man the white man is the cause of all problems and i do think that we've gone way too far on that for sure i've seen white men who have been allies who have been progressives who have been who were hippies protesting the vietnam war in the 60s who have absolutely 100 percent their entire lives been for equity and equality in this country um uh, you know an equitable nation they are now starting to say i'm sick of being blamed for everything because i'm a white man like i'm, I'm tired of this <laughs> so i do think that we have overcorrected uh, and I think that's like a natural feeling when you feel like you've been bullied. I think we're seeing this in a lot of the communities, you know, people of color that they feel like for centuries that they were kept down. 
And so, and now they can freely speak up without recourse, without being, without worrying about their personal safety for speaking out. And so, hey, it's like a teenager, right? Like the, when they start to get a little bit of freedom and a sense of freedom, sometimes they can go like hog wild with it yeah, and, and go a little overboard. But I think it's, it's understandable, natural, but I do think that some of us on the left need to say, okay, hold it. Right. <laughs> hold it, you know, and that's that, too far. That was going to bring me to my question as well, that, you know, because there are certain people or parts of the left that are now coming out and saying, okay, hold it, let's backtrack a little bit, you know, let's, let's, let's rein this in a little bit. Do you think that now there's a great opportunity for the progressives to be like, you know what, okay, we've gone too far, let's, let's try and scale it back just a little bit, because we're not saying that the problems that the left has raised are necessarily illegitimate problems or that those problems don't exist. But there's probably got to be a more balanced way of handling these problems or talking about these problems. And I feel like that's where, you know, with your definition, a progressive could, sorry, a progressive could come in and maybe course correct a little bit. So with that, Yeah, and gain conservatives like, and gain conservatives in that. Right, um, right. You know, well, what I notice is that liberals, you know, like conservatives right now, they're just looking at the liberals and the left and they're saying, oh my gosh, they're crazy. They're outrageous. I don't want anything to do with them. Right. Like they're all nutty. They've gone mm. off the deep end. And I think when they hear a voice and I hear this a lot on my channel and emails that I get from people that say, I'm a conservative, I'm on the opposite side of the spectrum, but I like watching your videos because I feel like you're rational. Right. And I, I think that when you get somebody who Isn't says, that crazy okay, that being rational is now a scarce commodity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I right. think rational is now seen as a compliment. Oh, they're, yeah, they're, right. they're normal. <laughs> right, right. That should be like what should be the norm. Right. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity when somebody can come around and say, look, I am for these progressive policies, uh, but I'm also not going to get involved in all this outrage that's going on, you know, this like uh, overblown thinking things are an overblown problem more, way more than they already are. Um, and then I think they see that and they say, oh, okay, well, maybe I should listen to you a little bit because I like this. So what else might I like if I listen to you a little longer? And that is how you convert people to the progressive movement. You know, that's how sure. you get people to start to say, okay, I'm going to open up my mind to this. It's again, it's conversation. Sure. It's when you can talk to people and when people are willing to listen to one another, you can start changing minds. You can start saying, hmm, okay, you know. I didn't really think of that. Maybe that is a good idea. Right. So doing the show with and looking at this issue from a broader perspective, what sort of a scope do you see for a progressive candidate in 2020? What do you mean? In terms of like getting a nomination, in terms of getting enough support to be able oh. to cure a nomination and possibly, you know, uh, become president. Yeah, I think that there's a good chance. Okay. Um, I think that there is, I think now is a really good chance to do this. Um, I, I don't, I, I do think though that staying level headed and not falling trap, which I feel like Bernie is doing a little falling mm. trap into the narrative, into the outrage left narrative. Um, I think if you could kind of keep your cool and keep your level head and not fall into that, that you'll actually gain more support. I think it's easy to fall into the outrage trap because they are the most vocal. So it does make a person feel like, oh my gosh, if I don't get in with these people, then I am going to lose, right? Because right. there's just so many of them. And I don't think there's actually so many of them. Right. I actually think that the majority remain silent because they don't want to be called a racist or a bigot or a xenophobe or something. <laughs> so they don't say anything. But they will say something when they're in that private ballot box. That's when right. they'll do their talking. And it's who they yeah. vote for. And also, it's far more catchy. Uh, the sort of some of these outrage left slogans, let's say, are far more catchy for election season than like a progressive slogan. For example, you know, something like defeat fascists is far more catchy on the <laughs> right. internet than something like, hey guys, let's think about stuff. Let's sit down and have a conversation. Like, right. put, try putting that on a future. Right, right. And I even fall trap to it too. I mean, I'm definitely not immune. I, I 100%, there's things I've said, you know, on my show that I regret. I look back and I'm like, eh, now that I've thought about that a little bit more, I've done a little bit more research. Like, 
okay, you know, maybe I was wrong there to kind of jump the gun and, and fall prey to the narrative. Well, that's evolution, right? Yeah. So I, I do think that, you know, we do need to have like climate change, for example. Mm. Um, we need to have conversations about this. I do think, though, that some on the left have gotten to the point the rhetoric has become a little bit outrageous, where it is kind of like, oh my gosh, it's doomsday. And what was interesting is that in my research, you know, and I, I look, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know. So all I can do is just think, I guess it's doomsday. I mean, I don't have the resources to start looking into this myself. I certainly don't have the scientific mind to go and do that either. So I'm just going to have to believe what I'm told, right? Um, but I do think that the scientists say one thing, and then I think that the outrage machine takes that thing and oh, and makes it way more doomsday-ish right. than even what the science, scientists are saying. Scientists are like, this is going to be a real big problem uh, because this is going to fo force migration. This is this means you know X, Y, and Z, and they're painting a very scientific picture. And then these and then some people take it and they say it's the end of the world. You know, 10 years, that's it, guys. Right. <laughs> it's all going to blow. And what the scientists are really saying is, no, this just means certain parts of the world are going to be uninhabitable, right. not the whole world, but right. parts of it. And that that's a problem. But right. it's not going to be doomsday for the world. It's over. Um, and I kind of fell into that trap at one point where I said, you know, oh, the world's going to end. And, right. and then people called me out on it. And, and then I felt stupid. I felt like, oh, gosh, how silly of me to say that. I shouldn't have said that. That was right. I know that in my mind. But I said it because it's catchier. Yeah, yeah, true. But I also think that there's I think a, there's a broad consensus among scientists as well that and like you were saying, and I think you're right, where, you know, large parts of the earth or large parts of the world are going to become uninhabitable, are, are going to have temperature changes or climate changes that yeah. they will find it impossible, near impossible, if not completely impossible to overturn. Right. So th there's going to be situations like that. And uh, I, I do think that we need to be in a situation mentally, at least, where we look at these issues, because uh, Let's look at the part, the part of the world that I come from. Let's look at India. Let's look at the areas around India, particularly in the Middle East and other areas in Asia, where this problem is a lot more pronounced because what's happened over the past few uh, couple of centuries is that the major pollution producer used to be Europe and then the United States. And then they said, okay, we're at a stage in our development where we're a developed economy, so we can now take steps to reduce those emissions, reduce the pollutions. But now Asia in, is in a state where they're in their developing phase. You know, they're undergoing their industrial revolution. Same so, with Africa. Same with Africa, exactly. Yeah. And they're going undergoing their industrial revolution. So they're now in a position where they're producing a lot of pollution. And unfortunately, they're also the ones that are now suffering from it, right? So, right. Uh, so now I feel like there we are in a position where if we don't necessarily act quickly, then there could be certain changes that we might not be able to undo, particularly in Asia. Now, Europe and North America might not face those effects, let's say this century. Maybe they face it next century, but they're definitely coming. So I feel like a certain amount of urgency is sure. probably warranted. For sure. But I but also it feel like... Yeah, but I also feel like, you know, when people ask questions about it, when people say, okay, tell me more or tell me this or tell me that, that if we scream at them, if we call them names, then do you really think calling people names is going to change their minds? Right. When exactly. in the history of humankind has calling someone names <laughs> changed their mind? Right. All of a sudden they say, you know what? I see the light. You're right. <laughs> You're yeah. right. Oh, thanks for calling me an asshole. I agree right. with you now. No, I yeah. agree. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's kind of my point is that, um, you know, what happened was a lot of people on the left have taken the science and then they've blown it out and they've said, oh, oh my gosh, you know, this is going to be it rather than saying the way you said it, right? The way you said it, it's like, that's reasonable. That's rational. I think that that would actually be a lot of conservatives could agree with that. And then you can start getting people on board with the policy changes. You could then say to people, look, we, we, this is urgent. Actually, we do need to make some change today. Um, rather than saying, this is what it is. And then the conservatives look at the, the science themselves too, because they have access to it also. And they're reading it and they're saying, that's not what this says. And then when they say that, all of a sudden it's this, you're a science denier, right? right? And it, it turns into this, 
this, um, you know, because one side decided to conflate and then and then they dig their heels in even more. And then they say, yeah, I am now going to just deny the science because I don't even want to agree with you because you're crazy. Right. So it it, it kind of creates this. Um, it does turn into doom, you know, because it, we won't be able to talk and then people dig in their heels and we're very team oriented and and that you just want your team to win and the other one to lose. And it right. and then we all lose when it's like that. So. You know, that's that's the thing is having a rational discussion about it and saying and, you know, when conservatives point out, hey, listen, they said this to us 10 years ago. Mm. and Here we are, you know, 10 years later, um, you know, there's there we've got to have some there, there just needs to be more conversation about everything for sure. And, you know, and I'm a big environmental person. I when I was the way I got into politics even was starting in the environmental movement, I wrote a bill or I uh, uh, proposed legislation right. when I was 11. That was an anti-deforestation oh, wow. bill. Yeah. Yeah. I was worried about the environment. I was right. 11 and I was worried that we were cutting down too many trees and that we were going to ruin our air. And, and we were, you know, and we did. Right. So um, I proposed legislation when I was 11 years old to combat anti-deforestation. So, uh, or to combat deforestation. Right. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like climate science. I mean, I drive a Prius, you know, <laughs> like I'm in all the boxes. Yeah. I'm real yeah. conscious of it, but at the same time, I still think we need to have, we can't just shut people down. Sure. Um, and, and that's not just with that. I, you know, I, I use that as an example because it's not a social justice thing. Sure. And, but we are also having these battles about social justice. We're having this battle and we're calling everybody phobes and racists and xenoph you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah. We just shut down conversation and it's happening on both sides, but on the right and the left, between the right and the left. <laughs> yeah, I know. And let's just talk about this quickly because I, I really wanted to bring it up when we were talking about it offline is this whole... <laughs> The privilege thing is an important one because, yeah, I understand, you know, you talk about, okay, whites have certain privileges, fine. I'll, I'll grant you that they may have certain privileges ingrained within American society. But to say that everything that someone achieves is because of privilege is also, I think, taking that uh, taking that string and pulling that string just way too far. Yeah. Because, and we were talking about this and you brought up, and it was a great example, you brought up about the school in, I believe, New York. Yeah. Uh, and if you want to just quickly just give a bit of a rundown about what happened there, I think that's a great example of how some issues get taken too far. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's a battle I've been fighting these last two days. I'm going to actually right. do a show on this. But um, basically what has gone on is that there's a public school. It's a, an elite public school where they take the best and the brightest from the public school and they send them off to this like better public school. And about 900 kids get in each year. This year, the stats came out that only seven of those kids were black of the 900. And so there's this big social media outreach that was going on even yesterday and today, and even Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez jumped in on it. And a lot of these prominent people, politicians and journalists and activists were saying, this is racism. Look at this, right. seven black kids out of 900. This, the, the public school system has so many black kids, like the percentages are way more black kids. Why is it that there's only seven? And it, you know, it, it, people were like, oh my gosh, racism, racism. Well, then people started pointing out, the rational people started pointing out and said, well, did you read the study? Because it turns right. out that 74% of those roughly 900 who got in are Asian. So you got all these Asian kids who are getting in. 74%. And not only that, so then people were saying, well, it's privilege. It's because Asians are privileged. And right. I, you know, as a half Asian woman myself, I'm sitting there like, oh my gosh, like I've heard this so much now over the few years. I've heard that Asians are now white, yeah. that we're now white, you know, because we basically become privileged like white people. Right. Um, and, I, you know, when I ask them to explain that, what they usually try to cite is that Asians come across with a lot of money. Like they immigrate with money, which is just not true. Right. Um, but there is this, there is this I mean, kind of talked about it, right? That if if they were so rich when they were coming into the United States, why would they go work at gas stations? Right. Yeah. Why would they go work at nail salons? You right. Know, why would they go work? 
dry no cleaning clean and you know, yeah, like all the cleaning. all the worst jobs yeah. you know my family scrubs feet my family that immigrated here from vietnam that is literally what they do what they're doing right this second that we're doing this right here they're on their hands and knees scrubbing someone's feet right so and they did you know my family they made that choice and so that the next generation, my generation, I was the first one born here in the United States on my mom's side of the family. They did that so that we would have a shot at going to college so that we could then get edit engineering or medical jobs, right. which we were also talking about. I disappointed my family <laughs> and they still don't understand what I do for a living. And my mom's always trying to convince me to quit and to go and do something in the sciences. Um, but that's, you know, the Asian mentality has is and what people don't understand and there's not really any asian advocates right. um when you look at social media when you look at what is the narrative going on in america there's really no prominent asian activist at the same time i feel like there's even if they feel like they want to speak out they feel scared that if they speak out there's just going to be this avalanche of negativity and hatred piled on them that oh you're just playing into the white nationalist narrative that, yeah, there's uh, that right. There's that you're a puppet, which colleges. and I've heard that about the Harvard, the uh, the kids that were suing Harvard, the Asian kids. Right. Whenever I bring that up, saying, "Look, like even for me when I was going to college, I learned not to put Asian on my college application. I didn't wow. mark that box. <laughs> I luckily have a choice because I'm half white, sure. so I was able to put white. I found it was better for me to put white." because there were so many Asians in the schools that I was applying to that I was told by the admission counselors that they would maybe discriminate against me for being Asian, that they wow. would want more diversity and being white was diverse <laughs> in the schools. So I would not mark, I would put white, you know? Um, and one of my stories that I always tell is that look like, and this has been going on forever. I mean, I'm nearly 40 years old and I went to college many, many years ago. Yeah. And when I was in school and I went to the, I went to UC Davis, um, the shuttle that took us to school was uh, my first day. I got on the shuttle and I'm sitting there and I'm looking around. I'm like, oh my gosh, everybody on this shuttle is Asian. I am the only white person on this shuttle and I'm half Asian. Right. <laughs> That's You're how Asian this yeah, that's how Asian this school is, that even the white people are Asian. Um, but, you know, Asians, so it's been this battle about this school saying like, oh, this is racism, this is racism. But then you point at these Asian kids and then and then they, they change their narrative and they say, well, that's because they were privileged somehow. And I'm like, how? And they say, well, they came from money. And I say, well, no, actually the stats show that half of the school, nearly half of the school, all of the kids qualify for um, the program, basically they're poor. It, it right. showed the stats showed that half the school's poor. Well, if 75% of the school is Asian and half the school is poor, um, you're getting a lot of poor Asian kids and it's mm -hmm. still disproportionate. The number of those Asian kids that are poor, there's still just a huge chunk of Asian kids at this school, right? And this is everywhere in, in the country. We're seeing Asians flooding into the education system. Now you and I both know as Asians, uh, what home life is like as an Asian and what home like home life is. is I, now I have a unique vantage point because I'm half white. So I intimately got to see white culture and intimately got to see Asian culture. Most people don't get to see this. They only see one culture I, and they guess, they have to guess what other cultures are like. I don't have to guess, I saw two and it's different. My Asian family, um, on my cousins, I have 20 cousins on both sides of my family. On my Asian side, my cousins were, uh, it was very strict. Home life was very, very strict. It was, you come home from school, you study. And if you're right. not studying, what are you doing? You need to be studying. And mom okay. and dad will make great, they will go to great sacrifice to ensure you can study. And grandma moves in and watches the kids so that mom and dad can go and scrub feet yeah. and work at the gas station. And you know, family members will move in together to pool resources together so that somebody can be at home with the kids, making sure they're studying while others are going off and working. Um, you know, and and that makes for a different experience. Something There's that a great emphasis, right? There's a great emphasis on education. I huge. Think, I feel like within Asian communities, because they've seen over the past 50, 60 years since those countries have become independent, they've seen that 
the way out of where we are in our current situation once our countries are independent is for us to study get into school you know make a good life for yourselves and something you mentioned as well i really want to bring up really quick get into jobs that are well-paying jobs you know these are possibly recession free jobs and b also these are jobs that pay really well so that you can provide for your family and you can set up the next generation for even further success exactly and and that's a real real uh priority among asian communities Huge priority. I mean, it's you know, in white families, like for example, my family, they were always saying, you can be whatever you want to be. Right. Do what makes you happy, right? We were told, do what makes you happy. You never Find hear yourself. that. Yeah. You're never going to hear that in an Asian family. They're never going to say, do what makes you happy. <laughs> Find yourself. Go ahead and do art, do music, do acting. Um, you know, and I, I hear this all- for like half an hour and then come back and study. <laughs> right. And then you need yeah. to be studying. <laughs> yeah. And you need to go and be a doctor and, oh, you want to act? Well, first you're going to be a doctor and right. then you can go and become an actress, but you're going to be a doctor. Um, and, you know, because I'm half white, I, of course, went into radio and all that. And my, my Asian family still doesn't understand. And they think that I, you know, they're always trying to give me money whenever they see me because they think I'm super <laughs> broke. They, they just assume they're like, we think okay. you must be broke. You know, you're not a, you're not like the rest of us. Right. The rest of them are in the medical field or in engineering. They went into computer sciences and medicine. Very, very stereotypical. Right. Um, but it was because that was they were told, look, this is the deal. I work my ass off. I go scrub feet. I do this, this and this so that you could have a better life and you're right. not going to let me down. And so then the kids do. They feel obligated. They're like, OK, then. This I might love political science, but I'm going to go become an engineer because right. that's the that's what's going to get me the job at Google that is going to make me the half a million dollars a year right. that raises my family up into a different socioeconomic class. Right. Um, and you don't hear that in a lot of other cultures as much, not to the same level. There is yeah. no doubt that Asians yeah. do it more than that's any true. other culture. And, and that's representative by, like we said, you know, the, the number of admissions that you find in colleges, in the school that you were talking about as well. So, you know, I, I feel like attributing that or attributing the number of Asian students that get elect, get that gets elected into Harvard or that school in New York, for that matter, attributing that to racism and some sort of Asian privilege, I feel like that's very reductive and it's a bit unfair to the... It's Asian very unfair to these kids who work their asses off. They don't deserve yeah. that. I mean, these kids put in the 10,000 hours. Do you know the rule of 10,000 hours that they talk about, right? You know, and it's like if you want to be uh if you want to be a basketball player, right? You know that going to high school basketball practice is not going to be enough to get you into the NBA. You're going to have to play before school, during practice, after practice. You're going to have to work your weekends, right? You've got to put in your 10,000 hours to be great at something. And Asian kids do that with studying, yep. with studying. Their parents have them studying and their parents will sacrifice and, and, and work extra hours to afford for their kid to go to cram school on the weekends. And, um, you know, it's not about privilege. It's about priority. It's what Asian families prioritize. So, and they happen to prioritize more than anything education because they know that socioeconomics matter in, in the fight for equality. And then, you know, you see now um, Asian fa- Asian families uh, have higher wealth right. now. You know, we see greater wealth. We see um, actually on average, I think they say that Asians are now out earning even whites by like 20%. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's just a functionality of going into engineering and doc- being medicine and engineering. <laughs> Those are high paying jobs. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and that brings us to the progressivism question that you were talking about as well, right? That uh, that enabling people to improve their social or enabling people to improve their sort of economic situation also goes to help them in a long way in improving their social situation. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And, because and you get the, the respect. Of, right. Right. And so coming back to progressivism really quickly before we wrap up, what do you see the future or let's say the 2020 do you see that that's do you feel that that's too soon for a progressive president or what do you see the future of this progressive movement being in the next five to ten years 
Yeah, I, I think that we definitely, definitely could see a progressive president in 2020. Really? I think that wow. is for sure. Yeah, I do think we've I, now in 2016, it was harder. But I think that the movement showed how much steam the movement actually had. And I actually think a lot of Trump supporters um, could be talked into voting for a progressive like Bernie wow. Sanders or Tulsi Gabbard, for example. Um, I do think that we could do that because a lot of the angst that caused the, the Republicans to vote for Trump was the same angst, is that they're feeling like the system's broken, they're feeling like it's rigged, they're feeling like their lives aren't getting any better. Um, you know, my generation compared to my dad's generation, it's very, very different. Like he owned, by the time he was my age, he had already owned three or four different homes. Right. Um, I don't have any friends who own homes right. <laughs> in my age group. Right. You know, we're still still struggling to buy our first homes. As we right. approach 40, we still can't. You know, as my dad's generation, the baby boomers, they got to buy homes in their 20s. Oh, yeah, straight out um, of college. Like two years after college, they buy a yeah, house. Yeah, it's like, that's impossible for our generation. Yeah. So as people feel this, as people feel that angst, as they start to see like, you know, I pay $500 a month in student loan debt. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, as we start to feel this, I think more and more people are starting to say something's got to give. And that's why so many voted for Trump. They just wanted the old politicians out. They wanted to vote for something new. They thought something new would bring them something better. It hasn't. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm hoping that those people will say, OK, well, well, then that didn't work. So let's try this other thing that sounds new and good. Right. So I do think that 2020 could be the time. Um, I don't know what would happen after after I'm a little I'm worried. I am worried about this election in that if the establishment fights back and if they win, if they do what they did last time in 2016, where they basically and we're seeing it now with the mainstream media against especially Tulsi and we're seeing it with with Bernie. They're calling him a socialist anytime they possibly yeah. can and saying that that's so bad. And they're demonizing Venezuela, I think, largely in order to smear Bernie. Um, and Tulsi, you know, aligning her with white nationalists or whatever weird crap they're doing. Um, you know, if they can win and if they can smear and if they get another establishment Democrat nominee, I don't know what the future holds. That is actually to me really scary. That narrative right, right there is scarier than if Bernie or Tulsi get the nomination and they get to actually run against Trump. That would be a better scenario for this country. I think if if it's an establishment Democrat, you're going to see a splintering of the Democratic Party. Many of us will just hightail it out wow. and say, that's it. This was that was it. Uh, and if Trump wins again, I think the Republicans might also say, forget this. Like, I'm not a bigot or a racist. <laughs> I, right, I right. don't want to be aligned with this crap. This right. does not stand for my values. So right. it'll be interesting what happens. It's definitely a changing moment, a pivotal moment for America. Yeah, it feels like it, doesn't it? It really does. It feels like, you know, people have had enough of this, you know, it's either black or white kind of politics, you know. It's either these kind of Democrats, these kind of Republicans, and, and that's about it. And whereas there is a there is this large amount of population in the middle that has different ideas, which is finding more representation, thankfully. So, you know, I feel like different opinions can usually only lead to a good place. So I'm hopeful that uh, something good does come out of this movement and uh, a more diverse, sort of ideologically diverse uh, candidate group can only be a good thing, I feel like, for politics. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. I mean, it's, um, you know, <laughs> You've moved here at the right time, haven't you? I, I, I certainly have. I certainly have. It's been a it's been a fun three three or something years, and I'm looking forward to 2020 as well. It's going to be fun looking at what happens, especially with not necessarily having a dog in the fight. It's well, so and you can always leave. I mean, you've got the you've got like the option. Yeah, that's true. Leave. I can't. Yeah, that's true. That's I true. To, I have to try to beg another country to accept me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, there is a homeland always. No, they won't let us come back. My okay. dad already looked into it after Trump won. Um, a lot of my family members thought, "Can we go back to Denmark?" Yeah. You know, but it's been too many generations. It was my right. it was my dad's grandfather, his ah. grand. Uh, so they they say, "Yeah, if you're the kid of, but not if you're the grandkid of." Now I could go back to Vietnam, I guess. Uh, <laughs> technically, technically, I'm still I have I I'm a Vietnamese citizen as well. I would qualify for Vietnamese citizenship. Right. 
Oh, I've never been there. I was born here, but um, because my mom is still a Vietnamese citizen, right. then the way Vietnam does it is just like America. If you're born to a citizen outside of the country, then you qualify to become a citizen of that of the United States. Right. So, if you, so same thing in Vietnam, except they're specific with moms. Your mom has to be the one oh. who had you. Yeah. They, well, mommy's baby, daddy's maybe. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. So, all right. so well, I guess like Vietnam, if if all if the shit hits the fan, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Well, at least at least there you go. The, we, we've we've worked on a semblance of an exit strategy. Right. 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 <laughs> if this and place becomes I, France and we start yeah. burning down. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Crazy times. Crazy times, but exciting times ahead. True. Lots to talk about, right? Lots to talk about, exactly. Lots of hashtag <laughs> content. <laughs> yeah. But, hey, Kim, I really want to thank you for coming on today. Uh, it was it was a really fun chat doing you know doing this chat with you. And again, I, I think I want to reiterate before I give you the last word on just how important it is to be able to talk to people. And you know, ideas will only solidify and. I feel like not change and not progress if we're not talking to people, if we just sit around in our echo chambers and scream at each other. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's fun. It gives you a little dopamine hit, but at the end of the day, what does it really change, right? So yeah, yeah I think I think you make a very good point about having conversations and, and I hope we'll be able to have more conversations in the future. I hope so as well. Thank you so much for having me on your show. This was really a great chat. Uh, really, really enjoyed it myself, so. And hopefully, hopefully we can have more conversations, you and me, and also yeah. just with other Americans in general, no, <laughs> as absolutely. we try to battle this out, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, I think that's where the future lies. Talking to each other is where the future lies. Is is what is truly going to make things better, and uh, less uh, less black and white. So again, I yeah. want to thank uh, Kim for joining me on the show. Guys, if you want to follow Kim, you can go ahead. I will leave the link to her YouTube channel down below. You can go check out her YouTube channel. She makes plenty of great content, so I would really recommend uh, going to check that out. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to subscribe to the Shyam Sharma Show YouTube channel. I will be providing this episode as a podcast episode as well, so that will come out next week, so please make sure to keep an eye out on that. All right, guys, I will see you next time uh, for the next episode, and until then, stay happy, stay healthy. I'll see you guys soon.